Hello and welcome to the My Heritage webinar series. I'm Jeff Rasmussen, your host, broadcasting to you live from Middleton, Idaho. Today we have DNA expert Rand Sneer with us, who is live at My Heritage headquarters in Tel Aviv, Israel, for his long awaited class Introducing Genetic Groups. Thanks to Rand and thanks to the more than 2,700 of you for registering for today's live webinar. Wherever and whenever you are, Glad to have you with us. Just yesterday, my heritage introduced this, Color Restoration, a groundbreaking new feature to restore the colors in faded color photos. And I gave it a try on my personal family's faded photograph. This was from the early 1990s, and it did a really nice job. And then this is my uh, great-grandfather at the controls of his engine, of the Union Pacific train. And of course I always like to use my favorite ancestor in these new tools and the results really were quite incredible. So uh, yeah, give it a try today uh, after our webinar up at myheritage.com slash in color. And now to today's webinar. I'd like to introduce today's speaker Rand Sneer. Rand is the Director of Product Management at MyHeritage and is responsible for all MyHeritage DNA products. So we've got the man here with us today. He le leads a talented team of developers, QA engineers, and designers to create and optimize DNA users' entire journey, from ordering a DNA kit, tracking the kit's progress, receiving results, to leveraging a continually growing suite of features to make the most of DNA results for our genealogical research. Most most recently, he led the development of the Chromosome Browser for Shared DNA Segments feature from concept through product, production and launch. And I, I guess I'd I'd probably update that to say most even more recently he's updated. Uh, he's uh, worked with the genetic groups that we're going to learn here about today. Uh, so everyone, please put together your virtual hands and let's give Rand Sneer a nice warm webinar welcome. Uh, hi, Ran, and welcome to the webinar. Click on that unmute button. There you go. How's hi, it going? Jeff. Yeah, yeah. Well, long time. Uh, it's going real great, <laughs> considering the times. Right. Uh, well, it's amazing to yeah. have you, and uh, it's a, it's amazing to see everything that my heritage has been doing, even uh, during these times, and and uh, including genetic groups. Uh, so yeah, we're we're all excited to learn all about this, and. Uh, Looks real good, Ran, and the time's all yours. Thanks again. Thanks, Jeff, and uh, good morning, good day, good evening, good night. Uh, I know we have uh, lots of folks from all around the world uh, here in Israel. It's evening time, and it's great to be back uh, talking to you and sharing with you uh, the things that we are currently working on, recently released, and uh, about to release or in the works. Uh, so today we're going to talk about genetic groups, uh, which is our latest release in DNA, in my heritage DNA. Uh, we released it uh, on Christmas Day, end of December, and so far the responses are great. Uh, I hope that many of you have already had the chance to look at your genetic groups. Uh, and but those who have and those who haven't yet, uh, I hope that uh, in the next hour or so I'll be able to give some more background and details and explain a little bit more about what are genetic groups, uh, how we built them, and how you can utilize them, how you can learn from them and uh, learn more about your history. So today on the agenda, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of background of what we have, uh, we had up till the release of genetic groups uh, on the MyHeritage DNA product. And then I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the behind the scenes, how genetic groups were created, how we were able to calculate them. Uh, it's been a long process uh, involving a, many people, many good people at my heritage. Uh, it won't get too sciencey, I promise. Uh, we'll keep it uh, uh, simple and uh, I hope intuitive. And uh, well, we're all here also to eventually look at the final result and the outcome. So. We're going to go over the feature itself and see how it looks. So let's start. 
So uh, since we launched my Heritage DNA product, uh, we uh, had the, we gave uh, to our users an ethnicity estimate, uh, which consists up till very recently of 42 ethnicities, uh, from which we were able to tell you what is your ethnical background, what what are what are your roots, where are you from, where are your ancestors from, and the. Definition for ethnicity estimate, as we call it internally in MyHeritage, is the architecture of genome variation between populations. So the way we built this is that we took what we call a reference population set. Uh, we uh, sampled people from all around the world who lived and reside and, and, and stayed in the same place for a, a very long periods of time, many generations back. And we were trying to look at their DNA and see what's unique uh, to these people, what, what can we learn from their genome and which parts of their DNA we can, for the simplicity, we're going to say color or name it uh, as a specific ethnicity. And we came out uh, with 42 different ethnicities. Um, this is a nice illustration I like to use uh, for those of you who have already seen some of my presentations in the past. So if, for example, we're taking Mike, and this is a little bit to explain how ethnicity estimate is inherited, uh, how uh, ethnic, um, ethnic uh, background is calculated. So if we look at Mike, there, is, there are two sides, maternal and paternal. Here we're looking at the maternal side. And let's say, for example, that now we're going to color these ancestors who, are, who all came from the same place, all belong to the same ethnic group in the color of purple. So in that case, Mike's grandparents also going to be purple because they inherit half and half from each of their parents, same as the mom, and Mike ends up with 50% of purple. On the other side, on the paternal side, things are a little bit more complex, let's say, or just <clears throat> more diverse. Here we can see uh, the two of his great-grandparents are from the ethnicity orange, and then the others are one is red and one is blue. So when the generation, when we go one generation down, uh, Mike's grandmother on the paternal side is orange because both her parents were orange, but his grandfather is 50% red and 50% blue. And when it comes to his father, we can see that it breaks down to 25% because he's, he's inheriting 50% from each parent. So Mike ends up as 50% purple, 25% uh, orange, 12.5% blue and red, which is his inheritance from his ancestors based on their ethnicity. And this is pretty much how um, ethnicity is going down from generation one to another. And by running the founder population project, we were able to come up with 42 different regions around the world, as you can see on the map here. And uh, this is what we're calculating when we're getting your genetic data. If you're taking a test with MyHeritage, taking the MyHeritage DNA test, or if you're uploading from another service, if you've tested somewhere else, uh, we're running your genome against our algorithms uh, for which we determined which portions of the, which SNPs or uh, marker positions on your genome are associated to a specific ethnicity based on the models that we've built using our founder population project. And we came up with these 42, uh, covering many places around the world, different ethnicities, and that's how we can say that your X percent this and Y percent that, and break down your ethnicity estimate to something that sums up to 100. And this is how the results looked like, looked like up until pretty much a month ago. Uh, so you can see here um, a John Smith, and you can see that he has different ethnicities from different places, mostly in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Um, and he gets a, a percentage for each of the ethnicities based on the models that we have. So that's what we offered up until recently. And we, for a very long time now, we wanted to improve what we can give our users and what we can tell our users about their history. Uh, 42 is a nice number of pull to look from and break down your ethnicity estimate to percentages based on, but we wanted something else. And we knew that we want to do something that we called internally and eventually when we released it, genetic groups. 
we were looking something to provide a higher resolution so that if today we're telling you, for example, that uh, if I'm going one step uh, back, for example, if we have an ethnicity today that's called the Scandinavian, that covers three countries and there are differences between those populations. Unfortunately, when we were trying to work with our models to break down, uh, for example, Sweden and Denmark or Swedish and Danish to different ethnicities, we couldn't find at that time a good enough indication to say that we, that we can break it down. The genetic looked too similar or it was too problematic for us to say that with um, high certainty that you're Danish or Swedish, so we had to merge those two and end up with what, with an ethnicity we call Scandinavian. So we wanted to give a higher resolution, and that doesn't end when it comes to genetic groups. It doesn't end just with the country level, and we'll get to that. Also, one thing we knew is that our model is not perfect, to be honest. There are many ethnicities that even though our algorithms were able and the work that we've done, using the work that we've done, we were able to break it down and determine what is unique for this ethnicity and that ethnicity, in some of the cases, it was just too confusing. There was a lot of noise in the algorithm. And unfortunately, sometimes we either gave the wrong percentages or allocated something that should have been, for example, English. We were wrongly identifying it as Irish, Scottish, and Welsh, for example. And we knew we need to try a different approach. And these are the key values that brought us to work on the genetic groups on enhancing the ethnicity estimate part of the product that we give our users. So we started the work. Uh, to be honest, that's wor that work has started pretty much two and a half years ago, and again, involved a lot of people from our science team uh, to the product team, to R&D and design and QA. And we wanted to make sure that the final product that we come out with is in a good, is in the best shape it could be, and also provide the more, more accurate results than what we were able to provide so far. So how we did it? So I explained a little bit about when it comes to ethnicity estimate that we were using founder population, taking people who lived in the same place and their ancestors as well. And from these individuals, we were able to look for those identical um, genetic uh, characteristics. Here we had to try a different approach, and this is what we did. At one of the stages, we called it the worldwide DNA web, um, and I'll explain what that means. Let's take an individual, for example, and I hope uh, at least the most of you on this webinar have taken a DNA test and will be familiar with the terms I'm about to talk about. So the person in the middle, the purple person, has taken a DNA test and he has DNA matches. These are people who have some genetic resemblance to him. They have shared DNA segments. There is something that binds them together. And when we look next, we look at this person matches, and then his matches matches, and so on and so forth. And we're trying to build networks. We're trying to see who's connected to who. How, how can we break down into small groups of people that are all have some uh, genetic resemblance between them. They are all matched to one another, uh, given some thresholds and different um, settings we put in the algorithm. And we tried taking these groups of uh, DNA matches and clustering them or breaking them down into groups. So if this is a family, sometimes we can say something bigger. Now, this might ring a bell to those of you who are familiar with the MyHeritage DNA product and have used our advanced DNA tools. And it's not that far away from our autoclusters feature. Those of you who have not used it yet, the autoclusters feature, what it does is that it looks at your DNA matches and it's looking at the shared DNA matches between them, meaning it's looking at your matches and then looking at your matches matches and trying to cluster them to group them together and say, here are, here's a group of people who are all matching one another or a big portion of them is matching one another and we can break them down into these clusters. There's something that's unique to them, something that's, that's connecting them and separates them from the other groups. What separates them is that usually when these people matching one another and are not matching the other groups, 
it probably means that they're all descendants of an ancestor or a couple of ancestors. And that's what AutoCluster is doing. AutoClusters on my heritage is used for any individual. So if you've taken a DNA test, you can run it for yourself and it helps you group your DNA matches in a way that will make it easier for you to work with them and better understand who's related to who and give you some clues on how to continue your research. Um, I gave about a year ago um, a webinar exactly about that. So you can look it up if you're interested. But the concept here is to take groups of DNA matches and clustering them together. And this approach works great uh, when you're working on your list of DNA matches, which probably consists of a couple of thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of DNA matches. But we wanted to take this approach and try it further. What you see here are billions of matches. Now, don't think of it, if up till now in the auto clusters we, we looked at it from the perspective of one person, here is a map that might show us how all of the matches in my heritage are connected to one another. We can take millions of kits and billions of matches and see who's connected to who and try and cluster and group them together. Um, the, the image here is just for reference. It's actually taken from Wikipedia showing connection between servers online, but the concept is very similar. It's just connecting the dots. So every dot here is a person and then lines going from him to other dots are the other people who he's connected to. Or in other words, these are his DNA matches and they're connecting to, connected to one another. And when we, when we ran this algorithm on a, on a big amount of, of DNA uh, data files, we were able to come up with clusters. This is just a tiny portion of what it actually, there's no real way of showing how this map really looks like, uh, this whole happening behind the scenes. But the algorithm actually outputs clusters. It tells you, here's a group of people who are all matching one another. And there's something probably that's connecting them or that's um, uh, unique to them. So the algorithm outputs these clusters. We took 1.7 million MyHeritage users, 1.7 million kits that we had in the database at that point of time, for which they had 10.6 billion DNA matches and we ran this algorithm and the output was thousands of clusters. So if I'm coming back for a second to this image, so imagine a map showing thousands of these groups, thousands of these clusters of people connected to one another. Now, if you can see, there are still links outside. It's not that they're uh, standing uh, alone or uh, isolated from the rest of the net, but uh, you can still identify them if you look at the map and see that there's something that's unique here, something worth looking at. By the way, there are many more here. I circled just some of them, highlighted some of them. So we ended up with thousands of clusters. And then we said, okay, let's look at these people. Let's, let's see what, what's in common for each one of these groups. So we took a cluster and we looked at the family trees of the people with the DNA data that we had. So some, in some of the cases, there are people who, unfortunately, many of you familiar with the pain that I'm about to uh, mention here, don't have trees. They've taken a DNA test and there's no genealogical data that we can use. But on my heritage, in the majority of the cases, we do have information that goes sometimes one generation back, two generations back. And um, I feel free saying it to this crowd right here, sometimes 10, 10 generations back, uh, back and even more. So there's a lot of valuable data there that we can look at and see what picture can we draw from all this information aggregated together. There's nothing here uh, that we're looking personally, for example, we're not looking at specific people or looking for specific individuals, but we're trying to look for commonalities in the data within that group. So we opened up the trees and we started looking at what we have. We looked at birth facts, we looked at death facts, places where these uh, events took place, different times. And we tried and looking at all this data anonymously, of course, uh, in high level, trying to come up with something that will be a little bit more interesting. What can we tell? What is the story that we can tell here? Is there something that's hiding behind, behind this? So as I mentioned, we use different data points to build the groups. The groups have already been formed. We have thousands of them. The real question here is whether there is a story we can tell, whether there's something interesting here or it's so mixed up that this, we can't really take out enough interesting data 
to give the group a name, a story, a description. So we looked at the ancestral events, the birth and death facts. We looked at common surnames, which in some of the cases can hint to a specific population um, or a specific uh, group of people. Migration events, we looked whether people from, moved from one place to another. We can see that when the generations go by, or sometimes if the person was born in one place but died in another, maybe they moved. And if the numbers are high enough and appear in enough trees, that might lead to a migration event for that group, a group of people who have moved from one place to another in a certain point of time. Um, ethnicities in a group is something that sometimes uh, played uh, a big role. So if we had two groups, for example, that were distinct, there were no connections between those groups. But when we looked at the data, we saw that these people lived in the same place during the same time, but we see that they're not connect connected genetically. And that's because these are people from different ethnicities living in the same area. So that's, all, that's also playing a role, also important to look at. And we looked for overlapping, whether there are geographical overlaps or, and also overlaps between different groups. And what we really wanted to do again is to tell a story is to look at the group, look at all of the data that we were able to aggregate and look at, and see if we can say something meaningful about this group of people. These are people who lived in a specific area in a country and stayed there since uh, the data that we have shows us. This is a group of people who have lived in this specific place to a certain point of time, and then migrated as a group to a new place or something else. Here are some examples of what the algorithm output. So I spoke about the differences between the ethnicities and the genetic group. So today, out of our 42 ethnicities, we have one ethnic group that's called Finnish. We have one ethnicity, which is Finnish, but we looked at one of the groups that came out, ID 396, irrelevant at this point. We see that the majority of them are Finnish in ethnicity, but when we look at the historical events where the birth and death facts took place, we can see that it's, it's pointing to a specific location in Finland. So now we can tell about this group, the people of this group, when we looked at their ancestors in their trees, we saw that it's, it's, it's pointing to that region. So I can tell these people now, not only that you're Finnish, you also have ancestral roots in District 12, for example, in Finland, which is great. Here's another example of three different groups that came out. Um, we have an ethnicity on my heritage that's called uh, North and Western European. And that's a, gr a great ethnicity, but it covers a huge geographical area in Europe. And we weren't able, for example, to tell you whether you're from Austria or Germany or France. But with genetic groups, when we ran this algorithm, we saw that we ended up with three different groups. And looking at the ancestral events, surnames, ethnicities in some cases, we can differentiate between them. We can separate them and say that these are different groups. And we can now tell something new to our users, not only that you're from North, but not only that your ancestors are from North and West Europe, they are from this specific area in Austria, for example. And I spoke about time. So family trees are a real treasure. The information in them that people in my heritage have contributed over the years is, is holding inside lots of information. And if you can see the animated GIF on the right, right here, this is group 131. And we looked at the distribution of ancestors in a time frame. So you can see here how it jumps in 50 years and you can see how it moved. So in the 1700s, all these people were in Germany and then they started moving into, moved to the east to, 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 the, to the USSR, to, to the Russian empire back then and kind of settled in there and then when it came to the 1900s, they just uh, went all over the place, all over Europe. So this story has something to tell. A group of people who lived in a certain time period in one place, then migrated to a new place, and then moved again. So we looked at this 131 and looked at the names and ethnicities, and we saw that these are actually the Volga Germans. Which it's, uh, it's an interesting group. Um, many of them are still uh, in Russia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan these days. Uh, but these are German settlers who moved from Germany to the Volga region, uh, mostly to establish farming settlements in that area uh, in the late 18th century. Until these days, some of them have preserved their culture, 
language. They have their own tradition. Um, and during World War II, uh, about one million of them were forced in exile. And that's what you saw previously in the GIF. That's about in 1950, they just spread all over Europe and Asia. So that's the work we did. And again, years of work, uh, the algorithms can help us to a certain point of aggregating the data. Uh, but m a lot of it, if not all of it, was manually reviewed by us to make sure that there are not too many noises coming from the trees, that the data is accurate. Um, and uh, most of this manual review was done by our awesome uh, senior vice president of product management, Uri Gonen. And after working with all of the initial thousands of groups that came out from uh, the algorithm, we ended up with 2,114 unique geographic regions or genetic groups uh, that can tell a different story. Each one of them has something unique in it, something that differentiates them from the others. Um, and I think that we are now ready to actually look at how this, what we've done, how this looks I, on my heritage. So without further ado, I'll jump right to it. So I hope you can still see my screen. Um, I'm looking at the Jane Smith account. That's a personal account, but the results are real. I just changed the name. Um, so you can see that she has um, in the overview tab, for those of you who are not familiar yet, you can access this by logging into your MyHeritage account. From the DNA navigation bar, you can choose ethnicity estimated look at your genetic groups. I'm currently in the overview tab, which showing an overview of your results, including matches. And here we can see a glimpse of the ethnicity estimates and also an indication of how many genetic groups this user has. And if I'll go to the ethnicity estimate, you'll be greeted with a nice pop-up telling you that we've introduced genetic groups. But you can also see, if you remember from my slide showing how the results looked up till now, we showed you the 42 ethnicities you had um, in a slightly different user interface. So we've completely revamped uh, this section of the website to support genetic groups and give you the opportunity to explore and learn more about your results. So what can we see here? So we're looking at Jane's ethnicity estimate results, which include both her percentage-based ethnicities, but also her genetic groups. One thing that some of you may notice is this genetic group's confidence level. Genetic groups, unlike the ethnicities, don't come with percentages, but they do come with a confidence level. When we were able to, make, to create, when, the, when our algorithm was able to create those 2,114 groups, we created special genetic characteristics for these groups so that when we look at your DNA data, we can tell you which genetic groups we think you're a member of, you are related to. And in some of the cases, we see a very strong relationship. We see a lot of genetic indications that you're related to the genetic groups. And sometimes we see less. So we broke it down to three different levels, which are the high, medium, and low. And you can play with this confidence level to see more or less of your genetic groups based on uh, your confidence level. So now when I'm setting the bar too low, I'm looking at all of my uh, genetic group results, which in total I have here 15. So here the default is set to medium, and we have seven out of 15 genetic groups for these users. Let's look at the results. So she has 39% Iberian, and under that we can see that we have four different groups in Portugal. Now remember I said that some, sometimes we can narrow it down to a country level, and sometimes we can say even more about a region like the Finnish example we looked at, and that's also the case here in Portugal. So we were able here to identify four different groups in Portugal. Up till now, Jane knew that she's Iberian, and the Iberian Peninsula consists of both Spain and Portugal. So we couldn't differentiate that. But here we see strong indications for Portugal, and we're mentioning that. We have a group called Azores, uh, number one, Madeira, Portugal, and Portugal Azores. Now you can see that she has two groups in Azores, one number one, num one is number six. And the reason that we ended up sometimes with that is because we do see 
a separation between these groups, either by the surnames, the ethnicities, or something else that, rings, that, that triggered us not to merge these groups into one, which is something we did in some of the cases. The algorithm output way more than um, 2,114, but in many of the cases, the groups were just too similar, and there was no reason to, to split them, and we decided to merge them into one. In the case of Azores, we see that there are different groups there, but there's nothing that we can ident um, we can give it a specific name that will be intuitive enough or accurate enough. So we're just numbering them. So you can see that she's a member of two groups there in Azores. I can hover over the list right here, and it will show me a, sm a short description about the groups. For example, this Madeira group is Portuguese in Portugal, Madeira, and their descendants in the United States, and some in Guyana and Brazil for example, and the confidence level that she received for this group is medium. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is another group of um, Portuguese in Portugal and some of their descendants in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, uh, also with confidence level medium. When I'm hovering over the list, you can see the polygon highlighted right there on the map. And you can also hover over it from here and see the same information. So we're telling you a little bit more about the group before you can dive in even further. And we'll get to that in a second. So in the list, you can see the ethnicities marked with percentages, and then the genetic groups nested under them. On the map to differentiate between a genetic group and an ethnicity, so the ethnicities are uh, without any borders, as you can see here, while the genetic groups do have these black borders that's surrounding them. So this, uh, so Jane right here has four groups in uh, under Iberian, Portugal, in the medium and high confidence level. And she also has one group that we were able to identify in Ireland, coming from Mayo, Galway, and two additional districts in Ireland. And the description right here, if I'll hover over here, you can see it probably a little bit better, are Irish in Ireland from these counties and districts, and their descendants in the United States, mostly in New York City, Philadelphia, Chicago, and New Jersey. As I mentioned before, in some of the cases, we can say this is a group that lives in this specific region um, and, and they stay there throughout time. But in many of the cases, the groups are identified by their migration patterns. And when there are a group of settlers, such as the Volga Germans we just spoke about, that's exactly what you're gonna see here. So here, this is a group of Irish people who have moved to these states in the US at some point of time in history. And we'll look at that a bit later on. So one thing to note is that sometimes you'll see the ethnicities and the genetic groups nested under them, but in some of the cases you will see them nested under a section we call additional genetic groups. So here I'm, I'm telling the Jane that she, I'm showing her seven out of her 15. There are additional eight in the low. So you can see the four under Iberian and additional one right here. And then the two, the other two are right here. And the reason that we decided to create this additional genetic group section is because we were not sure under which ethnicity we should nest them. In most of the cases, that's because the genetic group is a mix of different ethnicities, happens a lot of times, or because the user has both of the ethnicities that consist the group. So if, for example, the, we call, we'll call them for a second, the fathers and mothers of the group UK and Ireland that we came up with right here, um, are coming from different ethnicities, and so does Jane, we didn't want to take the chance and set, tell her that UK and Ireland should be nested under English or under Irish, Scottish, and Welsh. It could be under both, and in this case, we can't know. So it's a combination of the data we have for that group together with the user's personal results. So let's look for a second before we dive into the genetic groups a bit more. What can else can we do here with the map? So you can obviously play with the map and zoom in and zoom out as much as you want. Um, if at any point of time you lost uh, orientation and want to get back to the view where you started, you can use this globe icon right here and it will just focus you back on where you should be. And that works for every page we're about to see uh, in the next couple of minutes. Another cool thing we've done, I think, is to show your own family tree events. You can look at your ancestral events on the map and see how it correlates with the results that we've provided you with. So if I decide to tick the family tree events right here, and 
All right, doesn't work for me with this uh, test account. But you will see some pins on the map indicating the, the family events um, of Jane, of her ancestors, they will appear in the birth and the effect. And you can see how, we, how they uh, work together with the results that we've provided you with. Let's start and go to the Iberian ethnicity. And this is something that we had even before genetic groups. So when I click on the Iberian ethnicity, we're zooming in now to show you the ethnicities and the genetic groups nested under them in your results. So you can see here the ethnicity and the genetic groups along with the description and the confidence level that we were able to identify for you. If we scroll down, there's a bit of information about this ethnicity, the Iberian ethnicity, which you can read. Also play a nice tune. Which I'm not sure whether it will work over the webinar. And look at some of your DNA matches with these ethnicities. And you can click right here to go to the DNA matches to see the list filtered to only those who have Iberian ethnicities if that's what you're looking for in your research. OK. So I looked at the ethnicity right here. And I want to deep dive and look at what does this group tells me. The, let's go with the Portugal Madeira. So I click on the Portugal Madeira. And I'm taken to a different new UI user interface, which will tell me all the information about this genetic group that I have in my results. And let's go one by one and say what we, what we see here. So I can see that I'm in the Iberian ethnicity. This is the group I'm currently looking at, and it's group ID. You can read the description, the Portuguese in Portugal, Madeira, and their descendants in the United States, and some in Guinea and Brazil, and the confidence level which I have. At the moment, we have here this time period drop-down selection. And I can look at this group in different time periods of time, in, in different periods of time in history. So as I mentioned, this group was created by looking at the family trees of all the DNA kits associated with this group. We are indicating to you how many kits were used to form this group originally. In this case, 109 DNA kits ended up in this cluster that we saw before in the presentation. And out of these 109 DNA kits, 47 of those were associated, uh, associated or linked to family trees on my heritage. So we were able to gather ancestral events uh, from these 47 uh, trees. Using those 47 trees, we were able to come up with this information spanning um, almost 500 years of information for this genetic group, where they live and where they were. Let's start from the top. So in the 1600 to 1650, till 1650, we see that there are only ancestral events taking place in Portugal. And this component right here on the left, the top places, will update as I change this to show where this, what registered for these trees on my heritage. So you can see these places, and all of them are really in the island of Madeira, which was part of Portugal. Let's go 50 years forward. We can see some more events of people here in Portugal. And as I move forward, we can see some, pe move, some people moving to these islands right here, or more indications, or ancestral events logged in these places. And as we go in time, we now see the map has zoomed out. And we have this indication right here on Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. So probably, in some of these trees, we see indications of people from Madeira or Portugal, uh, mainland, moving to Rio de Janeiro. Let's move forward, and we can see some migration starting to the US. We can see some of these people. Uh, we see events logged in the eastern coast in the U uh, United States, and then in Guyana. So you can see people from Portugal have moved throughout the years from Madeira and from uh, mainland Portugal, have moved to different places around the world. And you can learn about the history of this group and the information that we're able to gather from it. So the time period selector gives us an option to kind of read the story or learn the story of what this group has to say, where these people lived in different periods of time. What else do we show you? We give you common surnames. In some cases, as genealogists, you probably all know, surnames are very valuable and gives us a lot of hints and indications to things we want to look at. So these are surnames we were able to gather when we looked at this family tree, and we can see Rodriguez Ferreira, 
Fernandez, Gomez, etc., uh, that have all um, uh, these are the surnames that were most popular in the family trees forming this group. And you can hover to see how many times each one of them appeared in a family tree. We will indicate in how many of the trees this surname came up. We are also giving common given names, which is fun facts and sometimes interesting to see that there are more, um, there are also co more common names than others when it comes to given names. And what are the common ethnicities for this group? So in some of the cases, especially when we're talking about uh, settlers and um, other groups, you will see that there are many ethnicities forming this group. But in this case, people from the Iberian Peninsula, it was very dominant. The Iberian ethnicity was the most dominant one. We will, sh we will look at more uh, examples very soon. Related groups is something that's also very interesting. So if I'll jump for a second, just a second back to the slide I showed you before. So we're seeing here a huge net of, uh, of places, right? And we can see these groups are standing and we could, uh, at some, in some of the cases, we were able to quickly identify them. But you can see that there are lines stretching from this cluster to this cluster and to this cluster, because people, because these groups uh, are connected in some of the cases. Probably were not connected enough, I'd say, to merge them into one. We still wanted to keep them apart, but there are strong ties between them genetically. And these are the related genetic groups, which we are also indicating here. So you can see that for the Madeira group, there are all, uh, uh, more groups for Madeira and Azores that are also related to these people. The algorithm outputs, and we decided to keep them as an isolated group, but there are other groups also connected to them. At the top of this list, there is an option to expand all, which at the moment will just show you a little bit more events if you're interested to learn more and see more surnames and more given names. And that gives you kind of a hint of kind of like an overview and detailed information about what this genetic group has to say. Let's go back for a second. I left the genetic group and I'm, not, I'm now back in my Iberian. And I can choose a different group, for example, to see what that looks like. So this is Portugal and some of their descendants in Brazil. By default, I'm looking at the time period of 1900 to 1950. Uh, but that's easily changeable. Here we can see that this is a group that was founded based on many more DNA kits and family trees, unlike the previous one. So here we had 1,500, almost 1,600 DNA kits that ended up in this cluster, and about 800 of them had a family tree associated with them and genealogical data we had to form this group. Let's look at the story of this group, for example, and let's start from the, from the beginning. So 1600 and 1650, you can see using the map and the heat map, um, the denser uh, the color gets, or the more, it means that there are more events in that place in that specific time. So in 1600 to 1650, the majority of ancestors um, associated with this group have lived in Portugal, and there were some in other parts around the world. And as we move throughout the years, we can see where people have moved to or how in Brazil we're starting to see more of this population. We see more indications from this group and they are spreading uh, in Brazil. Now you can see that there are even, this is, you can zoom in and you can see that in Rio de Janeiro we have um, a huge base uh, with a big number of people uh, from this group living here at that point of time. Again, I can always use the globe to center back. If I decided to zoom in or move further a bit, I can go in. And it gets even bigger and bigger. And at some point of time, you can see that actually the deviation, there are actually pretty much the same amount of people or ancestors or people from this group living both in Portugal and in Brazil in the Rio de Janeiro area, still a little bit more in Portugal. Okay, I'm going back to my main screen. And we looked at some of the groups that this user has in her results, but 
you see here only seven, or if you'll move the slider to see at all of the orogenetic groups, you'll see now 15, but we have 2,114. And knowing genealogists, I know that you're interested to see all. And the way we did that is using this show all available region option at the bottom. If I'll click on that, you'll see a huge map of the world. You will see your own results highlighted on this map, both the ethnicities and the genetic groups, but you will also have an option to look at different ethnicities and different genetic groups that are not in your results. So here, for example, in Iberia, for the Iberian ethnicity, we were able to come up with 154 genetic groups. And as you already saw, Jane has some of these genetic groups in her results. And that's why we can see a color dot. Ashkenazi Jewish, for example, Jane has 5% of that. For Ashkenazi Jewish, uh, we have 24 genetic groups, but she didn't get any in her results. We couldn't find uh, any um, a sufficient amount of uh, genetic evidence to connect Jane to one of the genetic groups we have. And therefore, uh, it's not colored. And here are all the ethnicities we have and the number of genetic groups. They are uh, grouped by the region around the world. So if you're interested in uh, genetic groups in Asia, you can look at that and see the ethnicities we have for Asia and the genetic groups there. And you can play uh, along. For almost every ethnicity we have, we were able to come up uh, with at least some genetic groups and in many of the cases with hundreds of them. Let's take, for example, America. And let's take the Mesoamerican and Andean region. So as you can see, when I'm hovering over the map, you can see uh, that this covers a, a, um, a relatively big geographical area in uh, South America. And when I'm going in, I'll be able to read about the ethnicity. Jane doesn't have that in her results, but let's say that she's interested. We're interested to look at that. So you'll be able to read about the ethnicity and listening to some tunes and also look at all of the genetic groups we were able to find. So for example, you can see a group here in Argentina. When I'm hovering over the list on the left, you can see these places highlighted in the map on the right. So these are the genetic groups we will be able to identify for this area in the world. So now we can see that we have Argentina and Uruguay, for example, which up till now we weren't able to say. We weren't able to pinpoint to that. We have no area, Chile as a country, and a specific region in Chile. We were able to break down Colombia to dozens of groups. Same for other places around the world. And I chose a couple of examples of uh, nice genetic groups that I personally like. And let's start with them. So the first one is a genetic group called Colombia, Andean region, which is under the Mesoamerican and Andean ethnicity. And these are Colombians and Columbine in that region. Relatively a small group consists of, uh, we were able to build it only based on a small amount of uh, DNA kits, 60, out of which only 20 had trees. But even that small group was able, uh, was able to tell us a very interesting story in my personal opinion. So I'm starting with the first time period, which is the 1600 to 1650. And we can see that there are many events taking place in Spain and there are already events, events in Colombia. And as I'm moving down through the years, I hope that you can see that. The map will zoom out a bit and we'll start seeing things in the United States as well. But you can see that there is less population in Spain and a lot of them are moving to the Colombia area. And while Spain is, there, there are less people staying in Spain, Sevilla area, by the way, and many of them are moving to Colombia and some of the Dominicans. Up until eventually, uh, we're left with just in the 1900 to 1950s, out of the trees we looked at, we couldn't find any more references of people still living in, in Spain uh, during that time of the people who clustered together into that group. So that's a nice story, a nice, a nice story of a group of people uh, originally from Spain about 400, 500 years ago who have moved to Colombia and settled there. Here's another nice group uh, of Mormons in Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. So I'm looking at the map in the 1600 to 1650s, and I see that many of them are in England, uh, some in other areas, but mostly in the UK and in the Eastern coast right here. And we can see that we decided to call this group the Mormon settlers from England and Denmark. There are some indications in Denmark right here. 
um, uh, who uh, th they were settlers in the United States, as uh, I'm in Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. And as I'm moving down the line, you can see that these people are spreading out in the Eastern coast during the 1700s. It continues like that. And then they're spreading to the West in the 1800s up until we see in the 1850s to the 1900, we see a big, a big portion of population residing eventually in the Utah area and Colorado, um, which is rather nice. So that's the story. We see that there are still a lot of people from this genetic group, um, still a lot of ancestors who are still living in the UK these days, but we can see that the main portion are to these days are living in the Utah area. So if you were matched or if we told you that you're a member of this group, for example, that's something really cool we can tell um, someone from this area about his history. I showed it in uh, Finland a bit earlier, but here is something again showing kind of the same concept uh, for another uh, Scandinavian country, Norway. So these are Norwegian in Norway, in Kvamenbergen, I hope that I'm pronouncing it right, in Westland, and their descendants in the United States, mostly in Minnesota. So these people have moved as a group at some point of time in history to Minnesota. So when we're starting from the beginning, 1650s and so on, we see kind of like a start of immigration to the States. But when we'll get further out, we can see that they're kind of ending up living in the Minnesota area. We can see that it's more common. Those who have migrated have moved to this area. Still many of them are in these specific districts in Norway. If I'll zoom in in Norway, we can see that this population mostly lived in these area areas. All right, one last, uh, last one before we move forward. So here I'm looking at a group which we decided to call Louisiana and Southeastern Texas, again in the States. And if we read the description of this group right here on the left, we see these are African Americans in the United States in these specific states. So this is when I spoke about the meaning of the, um, of the ethnicities, if we scroll down here and we look at what are the common ethnicities for this group, we can see that it's Nigerian and Sierra Leonean. I'm going back for a, up for a second. So we have two, uh, 290 DNA kits using which we were able to form this genetic group. And the dominant ethnicities for these DNA kits, their results on my heritage came out as Nigerian and Sierra Leonean. So these are African Americans. And we can see in 1600 to 1650 where they lived and how throughout time they started moving to the US, residing mostly in Louisiana right here as you can see on the map. And where they're living these days, according to the family trees we had. So this is another example. I was trying in this webinar to come up with different examples of groups who stayed in the same place and groups who migrated in different ethnicities and people who have lived in different places around the world. Uh, but there are so much more to look at. Uh, we were went over seven or eight or 10, uh, ten examples maybe, uh, but there are thousands more to look at and some tell a really interesting story. Um, and what we really wanted to achieve with this specific feature coming back pretty much to my first slide, is that we wanted, or the slide in between the ethnicity estimate and genetic groups, is that we wanted to give our users a high resolution uh, result to their ethnicity history. Tell them something that is more specific and provides uh, better detail about where their ancestors came from or which genetic groups they're members of. And uh, at least based on the feedback we received in the past month, uh, I'm, myself and my team were so happy to review and see that uh, many of you know, you have learned new things. Uh, in many of the cases, we were uh, spot on and it completely matched uh, the genealogical data that you had in your records. And um, 
also, I will say that we are using a lot of the feedback that we received so far to also enhance and improve. Uh, this is uh, a very, com I, I hope I was able to, to deliver that message in some sense. It's a very complex project that we worked on for many years and there are a lot of room for improvement, I'm sure. But I think that we made a very good starting point uh, from which we can um, grow, improve, and provide our users with more genetic groups, more areas around the world in, uh, which we can cover, and um, uh, improve both the genetic groups that we have, and even more important, and that's something I wanted to say for the end, also improve the ethnicity estimate that we give our users today. Uh, the ethnicity estimate, the percentage based, what you saw, <clears throat> what you see in the main screen right here, uh, is something that we believe that um, uh, requires more enhancements and uh, fine tuning. And this is the project we're moving on next. So um, I'm happy to say that we're already in the, in the, in the works. Uh, we're using a totally new technology to calculate the ethnicity estimate results uh, that will also w go hand in hand with the genetic groups. Uh, the results uh, um, will be more, will make more sense in some of the cases, because again, these are two different technologies, as I explained, the founder population SNP based that we're doing the ethnicity estimate on one hand, and the clustering process that we're doing for genetic groups sometimes end up with different results. In some of the cases, this is more accurate. In some of the cases, the other one is. Um, and we're now working on uh, merging those two together. Uh, Jeff, I hope I have a couple more minutes. I always like to have uh, some sneak peek at the end of my webinars. Oh, good. Uh, showing something that com that's coming up next. So uh, really, a couple more minutes. Keep going. Uh, this is something that will be out in the next couple of days. Um, so when we looked at a genetic group, uh, we had this time period drop down that we could use to change the years and look at the story, but we wanted to do something uh, a little bit more special and give it a little bit more twist and more fun and make it more of a con something that's more continuous. Uh, and for that, I'll jump for a second to my own personal results on my heritage. So th this, just this part till now, everything I showed you is available for you on my heritage. What I'm going to show now still is not available for you, but it's coming out in the next couple of days. So I'm um, Ashkenazi Jewish. Uh, and let's look at the group that I got, which is Poland, Ukraine, Russia, and Romania, uh, which my ancestors are really are from there. And if you look at the screen now, you won't see the uh, time period drop down anymore. And instead, you'll see a nice timeline component at the bottom of the screen. Functionality-wise, uh, it lets you switch the time periods exactly as I showed you before. So you can click on a time period and you can see where these people lived at that point of time and how they moved from one place to another. You can look at it as a, you can look at it one by one. You can jump from one um, point of time to another. But something really nice I think that we've implemented is the option to play the timeline animation. So in my story right here, I'm going to start. I hope it will go fl fluent enough or uh, smooth enough uh, through the webinar. But when I'm clicking on the play animation, you can see that the bar runs. I'm not touching anything on my screen right now. And I'm looking at how this genetic group, the story that it tells me throughout time, since the beginning, since 1600 till these days, and where Ashkenazi Jews have lived around the world in different periods of time. Um, and that's something that's coming out very, very soon. We're finalizing a few things, and we're going to push it out to all of you guys as well. Uh, so stay tuned for that. In some of the cases, especially when there are migrations, uh, it's really nice to look at the story in this sense and using the, time, the animation. And also when uh, the group lived in the same area plus uh, uh, in the same area uh, throughout many decades, uh, you can see how the population even slightly moved or more people moved from different villages or different districts to another, uh, even in that same area. Uh, and the timeline animation um, uh, let you see that. Uh, so with that, I think I will conclude. I thank you all very, very much. We're very proud of this feature. Uh, we're very happy to read your uh, result, your feedback, and uh, 
whatever you're posting on social media and sending to our support team. And uh, I've got some great ones. Uh, maybe for the next, web next webinar, we can share some of these. Uh, there's still uh, a lot of work around this. Uh, it's just the start. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll leave it up uh, for questions and for you, uh, Jeff. Well, Rand, that, how enjoyable this was. Uh, Diane wrote in saying something that I actually disagree with. She says, everyone will be logging on to MyHeritage after the webinar. I, uh, well, what I disagree with is the after part. I think most of us are on MyHeritage doing this at the same time, uh, just like I have been over here on my other monitor uh, just playing around with my uh, genetic groups as you've been teaching us here. And, and uh, yeah, this is this is uh, intriguing. It's fascinating. It's educational. It's, uh, I mean, somebody said, somebody here said that this, they see how this really could lead to breaking down a brick wall. And, uh, yeah, uh, wonderful. Other, other really neat comments here. Um, let's see. Uh, Julie says uh, her... Uh, genetic groups are right on target. Even the confidence level fits. Uh, Bernice was talking about her groups in Louisiana, and she was saying, yep, they're right on target. So, uh, Ren, whatever you've done, it sounds like you've done it really, really well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thanks so much for these tools. Uh, My Heritage just gets better and better. And, uh, and we're going to see Ren back here. Let's see. Uh, on May 11th is going to be the next time that Ran is live with us. Let me switch this over to me just really quickly, and then we'll get to questions. And, uh, yeah, so if I'm going to put this link in your chat area, everybody, uh, so you have that now. So this is where you could – that link is where you can go and sign up for the May 11th, which is entitled Latest Updates to My Heritage Genetic Groups, inferring that it sounds like they're going to continue working on this. Ran also has a wonderful library of uh, of DNA classes, and, and I remember my my time with Ran uh, doing this one together, and what a what a wonderful experience that was. Do you remember that, Ran? I do. Yeah. I do. Back in the times when we were able to fly from one country to another. <laughs> That's, I rem I remember that barely. Uh, yeah. So. Um, good. Uh, the, our our next My Heritage webinar. Uh, is going to be uh, by Daniel Horowitz. So this is coming up. Oh, I didn't put the date on there, but uh, let's see. This is um, it's, uh, it's probably the second Tuesday in February is my guess. And we'll get to learn about all the, these other resources uh, straight from Daniel, and we always love him. Uh, time to do a couple of door prizes. So if you're here, you're, you're eligible to win. Uh, just if I call your name, then just watch for an email from someone at MyHeritage. So... Our uh, first one here will be a one-year MyHeritage complete plan, uh, which will give you the family site subscription, will give you the unlimited access to all of the records up at MyHeritage and, and everything that's associated with DNA. And let's go and find our winner. Uh, we'll say congrats to Mark Waldron. Okay, just wrote your name down. Mark will be in touch. Uh, congratulations. And then let's go to a, a MyHeritage DNA test kit. And we'll say congratulations to uh, Sam Hudson. Sam, glad that you're here today and hope that was fun to hear your name on the air. All right, let's, uh, let's bring Rand back here. And by the way, because... Uh, <laughs> We've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions that have been submitted here. I'm going to recommend to you to, if we don't get to your question, uh, to head out to the MyHeritage uh, group on Facebook. And I'm pulling, I'm pulling that site up right now. Just a second, because I want to give you the uh, direct link. Almost got it. Okay, I'll turn my screen back on. And here is the direct link in your chat area right now. So uh, when you head right up here, just go down and uh, type in your question, or you can even search the archives there to see if your question's been answered uh, previously. So great place. Uh, you'll, if, if you're not a part of it yet, just there will be, I think, a blue join button somewhere up here. So just click on that, and then, uh, th yeah, then you can ask your questions there. Okay, are you ready for some of these, Rand? Yes, I am. Okay. 
Uh, great job Have again. Zip of water. You, you know what? Thank uh, you. Your your sneak peek. <laughs> I, the first question I was going to ask you is, I was going to say, Rand, what do you think about having a little play button to <laughs> to automate that migration? And oh, you guys have already thought of well, that. Well, Jeff, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, I'd like you to <laughs> implement my idea very soon. All right. Uh, a, couple, a few questions here at the top that uh, many people have asked uh, the same thing. Uh, first, let's ask uh, this question from Stephen, who says, how often do these genetic groups, uh, how often are they updated? Uh, are they updated uh, as you get more and more DNA kits at MyHeritage? Um, how does that happen? I, I'm guessing this is the first release, and, and perhaps there will be more in the future? Yeah, the answer, exactly. So um, I showed in my presentation earlier, so we used uh, 1.7 million kits to create these groups for which we ran the algorithm, we were able to come up with the output of the genetic groups we had and then going through the work of naming them, describing them, and um, unifying, separating them when needed. And then we validated them using additional 2 million kits. Um, the, good is, uh, the good news is that the database keeps on growing. And the even better news is that people keep on uh, building their family trees on MyHeritage and adding more valuable data based on which we can also fine tune the some of the genetic groups we already have and uh, potentially come up with genetic groups for areas we don't have cover for so we have minimal size we we couldn't take every cluster of every three people with one tree and decide that that's for example a genetic group or give some you know information about that we do need to see patterns we do need to see that the data aggregated make sense to tell a story that that was kind of like you know the motto can we tell a story or not is there something here that we can that when a user will see it he will understand it so um as for updates uh, we're currently as i mentioned before we're currently working on improving the ethnicity estimate that's the big project we're working on, working on now but we do intend to update the genetic groups periodically uh, and add more remove some that maybe you know are telling a false story that also also some of the feedback we got um, um, in s some few cases and add uh, more once we have them yes okay thanks uh, Elvis asks this uh, how can I know if my genetic test was used to create a genetic group is that is that possible sounds interesting yeah so I, I really want to make this point clear though because I don't know I'm sure it's interesting to many of the folks listening. All of the data we used is anonymous, completely anonymous, and was used to build this um, to build this feature to help us build this data. Otherwise, we just weren't able to do that. Uh, if we're looking at groups of clusters, we can say, "Hey, here's a great group of clusters." Looking at family trees would be very hard to do. Uh, when you're activating your DNA kit and uploading it to, or uploading it from, if you taking a test with a different service and uploading it to my heritage uh, it is optional to consent to to help us improve the product uh, by using this data so if you've done that uh, we probably use your kit uh, it might made it into your you are maybe one of the founding fathers mm -hmm. and mothers of uh, one of the groups great very likely okay thanks so much um, gosh lot so many so many good questions here Kathy says that she imported her raw data into my heritage from another service does that adversely affect how my heritage's algorithm interprets uh, her genetic groups so uh, as I mentioned my on my heritage there are two options how to join us or have your data with us is either buy a my heritage DNA kit if you've taken a my heritage DNA test this feature is free it comes with the cost that you paid for the kit you don't have to pay an additional cost if you are uploading from another service uh there's a a, a minimal fee you need to pay um uh, a one-time fee you need to pay to unlock the ethnicity estimate and the genetic groups along with it um as for wh how whether we're interpreting the data differently uh, again, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm now PRing myself, right? But mm -hmm. I highly recommend watching a different webinar I gave mm -hmm. about a year or two years ago about how we're doing, how we can how we can analyze genetic data tested with us and with others 
uh, there are different methods we're using, um, throwing um, some um, terms to the air, such as uh, imputation and phasing. Uh, we're trying to come to a common ground because the different companies are using different chips uh, for, uh, for analysis, and everyone is looking at different SNPs. Uh, there's a lot of commonality, but still there are some differences, and we're using algorithms to, to come to a common ground, to kind of like have all these kits um, aligned together. Uh, it's a very long topic, a fascinating one, uh, but we will be able to generate genetic groups for you, whether you've tested with us or tested with another service. Um, yeah, Perfect. Well, I hope that answers the question. Yep, great, thank you. Uh, Ahmed says, I don't have, a, and some others ask this too, they didn't notice uh, the confidence level. Is there a, a, a reason for that, um, that, that it just wouldn't appear? So I assume they are talking about the confidence level slider, which yes. you can move from the high, medium, and low. Yep. And that probably means that all of your genetic groups are in the same level. Oh. And if that's the case, just to you know, get you less uh, concerned about one more thing on the screen. There are so many goodies here <laughs> of polygons and heat maps and names. And uh, <laughs> so if there's no point of showing that, for example, if you have five groups and all of them are high, there's no point of letting you just move that spinner and move that slider without anything happening. Same with the medium and the low. So you will see your genetic groups listed, um, but uh, you just don't need the slider. They're all there. Okay, thanks. Mary asks... Mm -hmm. Uh, well, she, first she says, I have not added a tree uh, to my heritage yet, and several of her lines uh, she's taken back to the 1500s. She's wondering, uh, should I should I add my tree to my heritage, or is it is that uh, a bit out of the benefit range? I would say that always upload your tree, uh, not necessarily for the purpose of uh, genetic groups, as we're showing here. Your results won't change. Uh, whether you have a tree or don't have a tree. All the information I showed here, such as the surnames and the places we took and the time periods, all this information is data for this genetic group. It doesn't change whether I have that, I'm a, I got this group in my results and you had this group in your results. But having a tree on my heritage will first help us if you have such a rich tree with lots of good is probably in it, uh, we'll be able maybe to come up with a new genetic group in the next update. And also that will be very valuable for you when looking at your DNA matches, as we'll be able to match genealogical information from your tree to other to your DNA matches trees and get, tell you about um, uh, common ancestors, perhaps find the theory of family relativity, and many other goodies we have on my heritage. So I highly recommend uploading it. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, Karen's wondering about the ethnicity estimate. How many years back is uh, does that ethnicity estimate uh, look at? So it really changes, and it also varies between different ethnicities. The common agreement is it's in between the eight to, in some cases, eleven or ten generations back. Um, in some of the cases, it has proven people have uh, confirmed that the results that they got from the algorithms uh, matching things they know going 10 generations back. In most of the cases, it's in the 7 to 8, something like that. Okay. All right, good. Um, I'm looking at this uh, recommendation from uh, Julie, who's, who's talking about the, that play button. She, wa she wants music with the, with the play button so she can en enjoy <laughs> uh, the migration. Okay, thanks for your Is recommendation. It was Judy or Julie? Uh, let's see... Judy? Judy. Judy. Judy, I'll be more than happy to work with you on 2,114 unique tunes <laughs> for each one of the genetic groups. Okay. St start composing the music and Rand will help you. Exactly. <laughs> uh, sorry, that was Julie. <clears throat> Julie. All right. All right. Uh, Aaron says, how common is it to not have a genetic group? Uh, Aaron's got a tree up there. Is is that because it's still new, mm -hmm. or, or why would she not see a genetic group? Genetic groups, uh, we believe that 96.5% of anyone on my heritage with a DNA test should have a, at least one genetic group. Mm. In rare cases, uh, either you're coming from a very distinct, uh, um, uh, very unique uh, a genetic group, that we weren't able to identify yet, 
or uh, you haven't reached the low threshold that we set here. I didn't talk a lot about the differences between the high, medium, and low, but that's pretty much our way of telling you how convinced we are, since these are not coming with percentages, how strong the connection between you and that uh, characteristic of genetic group genetically uh, exists. And we had to set the threshold at some point. We looked at tens of thousands of results, and we set a minimal threshold. So below that, we just feel that in, many, in, in the majority of the cases, we are, we'd either be wrong or the information won't be informative enough. So a tiny portion of our users still don't have, but that's in the uh, thing, two or three to three point five percent, something like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joan Joan says that uh, in the past she's she's uploaded uh, raw results uh, from elsewhere, and she's wondering whether there be an advantage to her. Uh, uh, getting a DNA kit for herself and uploading that uh, also to my heritage. So if she's, she's taken a DNA test with another uh, service uploaded to us and whether she should test herself with the my heritage kit as well. Yes. Okay. So there are different pros and cons for each, uh, each one of these. Uh, there, the, I can say that the pros of taking a test with the MyHeritage kit, it, it gives you different access to different features on MyHeritage. For example, uh, this one right here, it it's included with the MyHeritage DNA kit. You don't have to pay any additional fee to view the genetic groups. Uh, if you're interested in our uh, MyHeritage DNA health product, that is also also only possible to get that portion of data using our own MyHeritage DNA kit. And this cannot be done with an uploaded kit, for example. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Uh, Bert says, do you include the private trees in your calculations? He says, I know it's anonymous, but uh, it, uh, just curious. We Whether we're taking that into consideration when, yeah. we're, when we're calculating the, the genetic groups? I think so. No, I don't think we take them. If, if the tree is marked private... And it's not intended for anyone to look at. We, we would put, put that aside. Okay. Um, Georgie says that she sees an uh, she has an uh, under one percent of a, of a certain ethnicity. How far back should she be looking to find the ancestor from that region? If it's if it's about point nine percent, she says. So that's tricky, uh, and that could. To, to be completely honest, the answer can be two. It can be two things. One, it's way, 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 way back. Uh, and again, going to the seven, eight, nine, ten generations back. And in some of the cases, that could also be an algorithm error uh, that we should have falsely um, allocated to that ethnicity. These are exactly, these are, these are the cases or the symptoms that we're trying to also solve with the new technology that we're putting in place to recalculate ethnicity estimates uh, planned for later on this year, still in the works. Mm, okay. Very interesting. Uh, we've got some people asking about the Ashkenazi Jewish uh, and where endogamy is so prevalent. Uh, how does uh, how do genetic groups um, interact with uh, with uh, endogamy? Hi, family. So the way this works, <laughs> um, it's tricky. It's indeed tricky, okay. and it, it, I, I, again, personally, I can say I can feel your pain. Uh, I feel it too. It's really difficult doing genetic genealogy, being an Ashkenazi Jewish. Uh, you can't look at small segments. Uh, you need to set uh, thresholds way higher than you, you'd usually do. Um, and it was also way more difficult for us to break down Ashkenazi Jewish into groups uh, and this is why, I don't know if you had a chance when you looked at my personal results, in some of the cases, especially when it comes to endogamy, endogamous populations, the names of the groups are very broad. So Poland, Ukraine, Russia, and Romania. We just couldn't break it down. When we tried running the algorithm and separating them, uh, it was just too difficult. And in most of the cases, it covers a big region. It's still smaller than what our Ashkenazi Jewish polygon for ethnicity would show. Uh, but this is another area we need to improve in. It's really, really difficult. Uh, but we can break it down to Central Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe in some of the cases. Um, so, again, if the DNA matches 
kind of cluster um, um, separately. Uh, it, it's a bit easier uh, with Jewish Ashkenazi. It's uh, it's a little bit more difficult. I agree. Okay, I'm looking here here at my father-in-law, and uh, so maybe he's maybe he's uh, barely related to <laughs> to you at some point um, at two point three percent. Well, good. Well, uh, Ran, I, I, again, uh, we've still got, there's hundreds of questions here, but head out to that My Heritage <laughs> Facebook group. Uh, at some point, Ran will go to bed. I think it's uh, coming, I mean, it's very <laughs> late where you are right now. But, uh, Ran, before we say goodbye, uh, do you have any parting words or final thoughts for our audience? I just uh, really from, I just want to say thanks to all of you who have joined today. Uh, different time zones and difficult times for all of us. Um, I love this platform. I love being here. Every time you invite me, I promise to keep keep on coming back. <laughs> Good. Um, it's 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 great what what we're doing here, and um, we we do this because we see that it matters. And uh, you gave a little bit about bio about myself when you started, and you say that I'm leading a team of talented individuals. And uh, they're talented, and the reason that we're doing what we're doing is because of the feedback that we get from you and the way that you respond to the product and the features and the things that we put out for you guys. And we hope to, we hope this brings light and joy and help you with your research. Uh, that's our end goal, and everything we do is trying to achieve that goal. And again, thank you all very much for coming here. This is the start. Uh, there's a, a long way still to go, and I uh, can't wait for the next update. So people have asked this. This, this mm -hmm. was the first question. Um, I want I want the next update already to happen. So uh, <laughs> well, we'll get there. Thanks, Ran. And, and uh, thank you, Jeff. Oh, yeah. It's always a pleasure to work with and learn from you. It's uh, I love having you on here. And what, what Ran was just saying about how he feels, it, it really – he's not just saying that. That's That really is – um, all the way up to the top of my heritage with uh, Gilad Jaffet. That's uh, they 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 really truly uh, believe in this and and want to do uh, good for the world. So um, it is uh, indeed a pleasure to be part of the My Heritage family. Uh, so thanks to Rand and thanks to all of you wherever and whenever you are around the world. Thanks for sharing part of your day with us. And remember, life is short. Do genealogy first. Bye, everyone. Bye, Ran. Have a good night. Bye, bye. Thanks. Bye. Stay healthy. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye.